Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Tina Evans. I'm the department head of the Applied Health Studies program here at the college. I'd like to take a few minutes to welcome you to our presentation of the Technology and Society Colloquia series. This series honors Daniel J. Doyle, a professor emeritus and the college's 1984 master teacher. We feature presentations by noted authors and academics, and the series is meant to challenge you to consider the impact of technology on our society. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have three experienced gentlemen here to speak to us on the topic of medical care on the edge, redesigning care across cultures. Let me briefly introduce each of our presenters. Dr. John Bull is the Associate Director at the Williamsport Family Medicine Residency, and he's a Fellow of the American Academy of Family Physicians. He's a teacher of residents and medical students, a provider of medical care to the Amish community. He's the Medical Director of the Little League World Series, served from 2012 to 2016, and a clinical preceptor in both the inpatient and the outpatient settings. He's published and presented extensively, focusing on quality improvement, chronic non-malignant pain management, and care for patients in the underserved communities. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from Messiah College, and graduated from the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Alexander Nesbitt is the Medical Director of Susquehanna Hospice and Palliative Care, which has been nationally recognized for excellence in end-of-life care. He's board certified in family medicine, geriatrics, and hospice and palliative care. For the past five years, he's been actively involved in a partnership between the Susquehanna Palliative Care Team and a developing palliative care team in a very rural, resource-poor region of San Tanzania. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in History from Princeton University and also graduated from the George Washington University School of Medicine. Dr. Thomas Ask is a professor of industrial design here at the Pennsylvania College of Technology, teaching here since 2001. He's a licensed professional engineer and a designer of dozens of commercialized products and systems and has also published books and papers on many related topics. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Illinois, a Master of Arts degree in Liberal Studies from Excelsior College, and a Doctorate in Industrial Design from Middlesex University. After tonight's presentation, we'll have a short question and answer session, followed by a reception in Rapture, which is one floor down and approximately located behind where the stage would be. Um, so at this time, um, I'd ask you to kindly turn your cell phones off, put them away, give the gentleman your full attention, and we'll get on with our presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Bull. Dr. Bull. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming out tonight, and thank you to Dr. Ask and Dr. Nesbitt for including me in this project. So in the book, Escape Fire, Dr. Donald Berwick talks about some tools that you can use to improve the system of medicine and thus quality. And in many ways, what Dr. Nesbitt, Dr. Ask, and I are going to do tonight is to use these same tools for addressing issues with disparities of care in hospice and palliative care. We won't address all of them, but I wanted to highlight a few. The first one, name the problem and then look outside of medicine, set aims and understand systems involved. And then finally, the one that I wanna emphasize the most, never ever lose sight of the patient as a central figure. In 2002, when I graduated family medicine residency, I went to um, Central uh, Appalachia in Eastern Tennessee, where I worked in what was known as the oldest community health center in the state of Tennessee. The clinic was in a town of, sorry, of 1,500 people with the closest hospital being across the mountain in a big city of 3,500 people. The community was quintessential Appalachia, very thrifty, resilient, friendly, and everyone lived together in hollers. Our county, though, was the fifth poorest in the state of Tennessee. We had high uninsured rates and um, limited availability to specialist care. 
Interestingly, at the time, five out of the top seven prescribing counties for grams of opioids per 100,000 people were located in central Appalachia. And then pertinent to this talk is that we had no access to hospice and palliative care. I want to share one of my most memorable cases and also a very sad case, but this was a 36-year-old who was recently married and he presented to me after he developed dizziness and headaches and had gone to an ER uh, visit uh, where he had a CT scan which was read as normal. He was given the diagnosis of a migraine headache and basically uh, came to me for follow-up. In the course of the workup, we sent him to a university where he had an MRI done, and the MRI revealed, uh, unfortunately, a suspicious tumor, uh, which ended up being a glioblastoma multiforme. He was admitted for pain control, and uh, through the process, they realized that the tumor was inoperable, and basically it was very aggressive. Our patient, who was really in the prime of his life and recently married, was given only a few weeks to live. Complicating this diagnosis is that he lived in a town of 500 people, and the closest hospice and palliative care program was several hours away. He did not have access to a lot of the technology we have today, uh, you know, to treat glioblastomas, although it's still very limited what we can do. Thus, he was sent home to die. This example highlights the problem that we are addressing today, and that's that one of the most complex issues faced by humankind is experience of pain. And if you would like to read more about this, I would encourage you to look towards Ivan Illich's book. Um, you can actually download the chapter off uh, the internet, but it's a, a very good chapter written about pain from a philosophical standpoint. But pain is influenced by culture, human experience, economics, genetics, and many other factors which lead to the experience of human suffering, which is what you and I see uh, when somebody is experiencing pain. Now, Dr. Nesbitt is going to go into more detail about this a little bit later, but realize that human suffering can only be relieved when we search for solutions which involve the many facets of how we achieve health, mind, body, and spirit, in the context of family, community, and the broader culture. One reason we are in our present opioid crisis in the US is because we relied on opioids alone to treat human suffering, rather than looking at it from the broader perspective of, of what I just mentioned. Contrast this with hospice and palliative care, which are multi-component treatment programs focused on the many different aspects of human suffering, including relational, psychological, spiritual, and physical impacts of that pain. The WHO definition of palliative care is an approach to improve the quality of life of patients and families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering. The definition of hospice is end-of-life care for medical, psychological, and spiritual support with the goal of helping patients have peace, comfort, and dignity when, while they're dying. As you can tell from this graph, there's a progression that occurs from disease-modifying therapy to increased comfort care into hospice, and then as the patient dies, support of the family, which occurs with palliative care and hospice. Although palliative care and hospice programs have grown tremendously over the previous decade, millions of Americans and also people throughout the world do not have access to palliative care from the point of diagnos diagnosis through their course of illness. As one research has, researcher has said, geography is destiny when it comes to palliative care and hospice. Now this is my most detailed slide. And it's a graph comparing palliative care's supply versus demand. And you can see that um, on this side is supply and down here is demand. So the US is right up here, we have a high demand for palliative care, because we have an elderly population, uh, we have access to ICUs and the ability to care for complex diseases. In this area down here, though, you have low, low supply and high demand, and China in particular is one uh, country that sticks out. Uh, Tanzania, which Dr. Nesbitt will mention later, is, is in the low 
supply and low demand section. And the reason for that is a lot of people don't live to an elderly age in Tanzania. But statistics vary regarding hospice and palliative care in studies. However, in the US, about two thirds of hospitals with 50 or more beds have palliative care programs. Worldwide, 80% 80, 80 of people, including more than 5 million patients with terminal cancer, lack access to pain treatment. In more than 150 countries throughout the world, morphine is simply not available. But if you want to remember one statistic, it's that globally, only one in 10 people who need palliative care currently are able to receive it. For my patient, the closest hospital had five, uh, 35 beds and was a sole community provider and had no access to palliative care and hospice. This is known as a healthcare disparity, and it's defined by the Kaiser Foundation as differences between groups in health coverage, access to care, and quality of care, versus health disparities, which adversely affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on characteristics historically linked to discrimination. So disparities are commonly thought of in terms of racial or ethnic lenses, but it can also be socioeconomic status, location, disability, gender, many other things. So kind of to make this more clear, as an example, lack of access to a mammogram is a healthcare disparity, but the subsequent missed uh, breast cancer would be a health, uh, a health disparity. So a model which links these two things together is known as the inverse care law, and this really came from some research out of, out of uh, United Kingdom. But over time, these obstacles to health and healthcare shortage become compounded with a spiral of less resources leading to greater need. So if you can look here at point A, it's an area that has high levels of vulnerability and need but low resources, so that would have been similar to where I practiced in Central Appalachia or Tanzania or Honduras where I've gone. Um, whereas point B are areas that have high healthcare access and quality with low need and vulnerability. Now there are always pockets in every community of people that have lots of vulnerability and need, but generally when you look across the population, our community is more like uh, point B here. So what is the big elephant in the room as we talk about this topic? For me, it's the lack of equity and distribution of effective pain management. To use the example of opioids, for palliative care and hospice, opioids have been shown to improve quality of life and functioning. Whereas this is exactly opposite for most patients who take opioids for chronic non-malignant pain. In fact, systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials, which are kind of the gold standard of how we have compare effectiveness in medicine, have shown only short-term benefit to long-term use of opioids. Patients on long-term opioids are at increased risk for abnormal pain syndromes, decreased functioning, overdose, and addiction. Per the CDC, one in four patients on chronic opioid therapy for chronic non-malignant pain struggle with addiction. This is also represented by this graph, which a lot of you have probably seen in some form or the other, but as you had increasing sales, you can also see that there's increasing deaths and in treatment uh, for the effects of opioids. But what pulls this together for our patients with both advanced disease and chronic non-malignant pain is the issue of scarcity, and that's scarcity of effective pain control. In the book entitled Scarcity, which is actually written by a Harvard and Princeton economist, it's a really great book. The authors highlight how scarcity captures the mind. And if you can imagine when you were really thirsty or really hungry or really tired, just the inability to think beyond that, that's really what they're talking about. Imagine if you didn't have enough treatment for your pain and how that would, what that experience would be like, how your focus of your pain would cause you to get tunneling, the inability to see any other options, and the inability to see the world without looking through the lens of that scarcity. This tunneling leads to a focus 
uh, which taxes our bandwidth, kind of like this juggler, and um, really makes it difficult to function. Scarcity of effective pain control causes patients in rural areas to rely more heavily on cheap opioids rather than more expensive options, which may not even be available in their, in their community. For chronic non-malignant pain, this leads to a higher risk of overdose in a community that has less emergency medical services. And if you overdose in a rural area, you're more likely to die from that overdose. In hospice and palliative care, the issue can be even more basic as no access to opioids, especially in an inter international setting like Dr. Nesbitt is gonna talk about. But imagine how the scarcity of effective pain control will come to dominate your life and decrease your functioning. So from a design standpoint, we need to address this issue of scarcity, which is what Dr. Ask is gonna talk about tonight. Also, we need to highlight what is success. Specifically, what is success when it comes to palliative care? For me, I would say the fundamental element in palliative care is the relationships. It's those relationships between the patient and their family, the patient and their caregiver, the patient and their physician or nurse, uh, the patient between uh, the relationship between the patient and their family, um, the community, um, a a pastor or spiritual leader. For my patient, while I did not have a long relationship with him, really only three months, we got very close. He, in conjunction with his wife, mother-in-law, who was a nurse, and I developed our own hospice plan. This had all the normal components of symptom control for pain, anxiety, nausea, but the difference was that we were readily available to him. The key to this plan being successful is, again, our relationship and that availability. I can still remember very clearly his last few hours of life. I just completed a long shift, um, a full day of, of work in the hospital, an overnight call, and a full day again in the hospital, when his wife called me shortly after dinner and said that he was declining and having more pain. So my wife and I went out to his home, and she really went along to help me drive. The family was gathered around him, and he was in the process of dying. He kept saying he felt like he was drowning, which was one of the effects of the, the tumor. Um, we provided him pain treatment and medications to help him. My wife and I stayed at his bedside for most of the evening, and he died a few minutes after we left. My patient, in the midst of scarcity of access to palliative care and hospice programs, had many resources. Those resources included his family, his community, his family physician, but what about our other patients, as they'll talk about in a few minutes, that don't even have these resources? How can we work to break down disparities, to design new systems, and to use technology to improve care? Thank you. Dr. Nesbitt is now gonna continue the conversation. So Dr. Bowl has done a good job for us of laying out the issues in the world of hospice and palliative care and pain management and scarcity. I want to talk a bit from the perspective of a bedside physician. So for the last 17 years, I've worked in our area to take care of patients who are really sick, who are dying. And for the last six years, I've been involved in a partnership with a palliative care program in rural Tanzania and I want to share a bit with you about that. But before I do, I want to emphasize a couple things that Dr. Bowl said. One is the understanding of what is palliative care and what is hospice. So palliative care is specialized medical care by a team focused on an individual who has some kind of serious or advanced disease, not necessarily terminally ill, but really sick and having suffering and problems, and we're trying to help along the way. Hospice is a kind of palliative care, but it is done for those who are terminally ill, those within months of dying. And it's a very thorough, thick way to come around the patient and their loved ones to support them. Essentially, everybody that we're caring for in the world of hospice and palliative care does not have curable disease. A lot of medicine is focused on diagnosing the disease, treating it, and curing it, making it better, making it gone. But the patients that we're caring for, you can't cure it. You can just help. And so we do. So in palliative care, we take care of people like Jack. In this picture, Jack was about 88. He had bad COPD. 
He was really short of breath. He had bad heart disease, bad arthritis, diabetes, neuropathy. He was having a lot of suffering. It was hard. He lived in a town not too far from here. So he went to the hospital in that town. There wasn't any palliative care program there. When he went to the nursing home there, there wasn't any palliative care for him there. Before his dying day, he was able to get enrolled in hospice, and it helped so much. So in our world, in America, we have an issue of scarcity, not enough palliative care for people who need it. But compared to the rest of the world, we are so fortunate. Because most humans all around the world, when they get sick, really sick, when they come to their dying time, they absolutely do not have access to people who are trained in how to help them. No team of people to help with their suffering. No access to strong pain medicine when they're having really bad pain. So this is a picture that gives you an idea of this. This is from a few years ago. Human Rights Watch did a study looking at the worldwide availability of strong pain medicine for people that had severe pain, cancer pain, end of life pain, who needed opioid. The only way to control their symptom is with opioid. In this map, green means ready availability of opioid for those who need it. And so our country is green, Canada is green, Europe is green. We actually have the problem of too much opioid in our country. As Dr. Bowl has said, in our country, too many people are using opioids chronically long term for chronic non-malignant pain. And it, often it does not help. Often people are at risk of addiction. That's an issue that we're struggling with in our country. But for most humans all around the world, they have the opposite problem. You just can't get it. So you'll see South America largely yellow, limited availability, or orange, very limited availability, or red, meaning you can't get it. This is Africa. And you'll see that all of Sub-Saharan Africa is deep red. You just can't get it. There's been essentially no access to morphine when cancer is eating into your bones. And when you look at the data, this means that more than 40 million humans every year are suffering without help and come to their dying time without control of their pain. More than 2 million children every year having this. It is daunting to think about this. So what do we do about this? And especially for tonight's talk, how can technology help? What role does technology play in terms of trying to extend the needed help for those who are suffering? Tonight, as we're talking about technology, we're talking about a whole spectrum of technology, from simple technology to really complex stuff, like what Dr. Ask is gonna talk about in a few minutes. As you think about what role technology plays in medicine, technology can do a couple of different things. It can extend the care that the humans involved in medical care are doing, reach more people, do it better, amplify the care that is being given. Technology sometimes can also replace human care in medicine. And we're increasingly seeing that in our culture now, and we are increasingly going to see that in the future with the tremendous advance in many regions as far as technology. Technology replacing humans? Well, this can be really good. So if you go to the mall, the AICD, the defibrillator, that's a machine that drives immediate resuscitation for somebody who is down. If you have an irregular heart rate, 10 or 15 years ago, you needed to go and wait in your doctor's office and then go lie down on the table and they do an EKG and the doctor would come in and read your study and then tell you what your rhythm is. But now there's apps on your phone that you can just activate and it transmits what your cardiac rhythm is. No human's doing this. It's really great. But what are the areas of medicine where replacing human by technology would not be great, would not be good, would be subtractive, would be worse. I don't like this. Where the medicine would become depersonalized, dehumanized. How do we know what areas of medicine are like that? So I think a key 
point in distinguishing this is the issue of suffering. If you, as a human, are suffering, you need a human to be a part of, to be centrally involved in the care that you get. Because only a human can understand this, can have empathy, can understand, can have compassion with you. The most fancy advanced machine cannot do this. So thinking about suffering, defining the need for a central human role. Well, what is suffering? So one of the very best books on this issue was written by Dr. Eric Cassell, 1991, an oncologist, The Nature of Suffering and the Goals of Medicine. If there's anybody in the audience who is interested in thinking about this in the world of medicine, how do we understand suffering? And how do we incorporate that into the care that we give? I commend this book to you. It's really profound. And Dr. Cassell says, suffering by its nature means that the disease that you're dealing with, the condition that you have, is threatening your very self. It's threatening your sense of integrity, the wholeness of who you are. This disease, this condition is taking away a piece of me. I'm never going to be the same again. Suffering is really individual. It's really distinct. You can have two people. If this guy and this guy both have the same disease at the same state, this person may have much more sense of suffering than this person. And what goes into that? Some of that is inside, your personality, your sense of resilience, your past experiences. Some of it is external. What family did you grow up? What culture are you in? Who is around you to support you as you're in the midst of this? So this very individual thing. Suffering is not the same as pain. So a lot of times we tend to conflate those a little bit. Pain, suffering, same thing. No, not necessarily. There's an overlap. Pain can be a source of suffering, but you can have really bad suffering with no pain. So if we have somebody who's a tremendous athlete, and his understanding of himself is he is strong and he is independent, he is great. And he gets a condition that makes it that he can never be that way again. He will feel a great sense of suffering from this, even with no pain. And you can have pain, but not really be suffering. If on my way home tonight I get a cut on my arm and I have to go in and get the thing stitched and it kind of hurts and it leaves a scar, and if somebody says, gee, were you suffering? I say, well, no, not really. The darn thing just hurt. Or childbirth pain. For any women in the audience, you know that it can really hurt. And yet the pain of childbirth is for a time. And there's stuff that can be done about that. And it is linked with this immensely wonderful experience of having a baby through this. So pain does not necessarily mean suffering. But in palliative care, in hospice, we are intrinsically dealing with people who are suffering. And so in palliative care, with suffering humans, technology cannot replace the human at the center of the care, but it can and must help us as we're looking to extend palliative care out in this terrible situation in our country and especially around the world of scarcity, trying to serve more people with our limited resources. So I want to share with you a little bit of the experience we've had over the last six years in a partnership with a palliative care program in rural Tanzania. So this hospital called Sharadi that started as a missionary clinic and has since grown to be about a 200 bed hospital that cares for a region of about 300,000 people. This is in a very rural area of Tanzania that is tremendously poor. Most people there live on less than a dollar or a dollar fifty a day. Most people are food insecure, not sure where food comes from for tomorrow. Almost no one has insurance. Most people do not have electricity or running water. Average life expectancy there is in the upper 40s. And in that environment, this hospital has done just tremendous work caring for the people who can get to the hospital and treating those that can be treated. But they're overwhelmed by the volume. They would treat who they could treat. And the person who comes in with terrible malaria or a badly infected appendix or something that's treatable, they would do it. 
but when someone would come in with advanced cancer or end-stage AIDS, they could not make it better, and they would say, we cannot help you. We'll turn to the next person and help who we can. But in that hospital, a group of people said, we must do more. We have heard of palliative care. We must do more to help people, even when we cannot cure them. And so they started a program, and about six years ago, we became linked with them, our palliative care program and theirs, and have had a wonderful partnership helping them to extend their palliative care. Initially, they just saw people in the hospital who were suffering so, and then started a clinic, and are now going out to these villages, which are quite remote, who are out a great distance. So this just gives you an idea where Tanzania is, and in Tanzania, the community of Sharadi near Lake Victoria. Technology in that world is simple. They make do with what they can. And yet technology has been so important in our partnership. So 20 years ago, for us to be linked with that community, we would not have known of their work. We wouldn't have known it. But we're linked. We found each other online. And we communicate with each other with the technology that we take for granted that's in our pockets, where we're messaging back and forth. And they send me pictures of their difficult cases and I chase down my specialist friends at the hospital, look at this, and we help with the technology that is just at our fingertips. And the team there uses technology to extend the care of the team. So the team is about 20 people from the hospital, doctors, nurses, social worker, chaplain, physical therapist, pharmacist, all working together to help their people. But they also work with 12 volunteers these volunteers, most of them are HIV infected. So in this community, HIV is really prevalent. About 15% of everybody in that community is infected with HIV. Thousands of people. And the hospital has done a wonderful job of treating these people, saving lives with that. And these volunteers themselves have gotten on their antiretroviral medicines and they're feeling strong and they want to help the people and so they're very engaged in looking to help people in their village or surrounding villages. Each volunteer is in different villages all around. When we were over there last year, we've gone over several times and people from there have come to be with us. Last time we were there meeting with the volunteers and we said, what would be most helpful to help you with the good work that you're doing? Because these volunteers are an integral part of the palliative care team. They're out in the villages and the volunteers use their phone this is a community where people don't have running water, they don't have electricity, but a number of people have phones with a little SIM card. And these volunteers have basic medical training. They do wound care for the people in their village. They do simple medical assessment, and they'll call in to the team and say, you should come, this person is very sick. As we talked to them, what would help you most? They said, it's very difficult for us to walk many kilometers to these villages that are far. So when we came back, we talked to people in our community and people raised dollars so that we sent enough money so that each volunteer now has a bicycle. Well, that's pretty simple technology, but it allows them to go village to village and see more people. And as we talked about the need to get the teams out to the villages, this is a place where the roads often look like drainage ditches. They're just rutted and almost impassable. There is one vehicle for this hospital it's a really old land cruiser. And so for the team to get that and get out to the village, often not available or not doable, especially in rainy season. But motorbikes, we can get there. So people from our area have raised money and have bought two, soon to be three motorbikes using this technology to get out and see the people. And when they do, when they get out and see individuals in the village, it makes such a difference. So in one village, one of the volunteers called and said, you must, keep, you must come see Ramadan. This man who's lying on the mat is Ramadan, and he was a healthy kid till he was about eight, and then he got polio, and he was neurologically devastated with polio. So he has spastic quadriplegia. His arms and legs are crumpled and non-usable. He can't roll himself over or scratch his nose. He lives in this remote village, sort of overlooking the lake, with his mother, because all of his brothers and sisters have died of AIDS. 
So each day she pulls him out on the mat so he can sit out in the sun. And he lies there. When the team heard of him and came out and saw him, they treated his medical problems. He had bad pain. His joints are so stiff he was hurting all the time. And they gave medicine for that. And they treated the wounds that he had. But more than that, they got to know him. Ramadan is a really smart guy. And he knew what he most wanted. And that was to sell stuff, who, people who walked past his village. He knew that he was so far out that as people walked past his hut to bathe in the lake, if he only had some soap, he would sell it to them and he would make money. And so the team talked about this and worked with church community and people around and bought enough to get him some soap in the box that you see up by his head and some matches and some lotion. And he sells from the box and he's made enough money to buy some goats. He's helping to support his mother and he's proud. And he feels like a man. He knows these people know him as a person. He's friends with them. When they go out, when we came out, we laughed together. So he's, he is better because of this person-centered care, which is what palliative care is about. In a different village, a different volunteer called and said, you must come see this boy who falls down. And so the team came out and saw this boy who was in the middle there, who was a young teenager. He had severe intellectual disability and seizures, atypical seizures. And he would fall down and do bizarre things and the villagers were afraid. And he had sores and he had infection and he had disease. And so the team treated his medical problem, diagnosed these are seizures, put him on anti-seizure medicine, stopped the seizures, treated his wounds, and got to know his family as well. His mother who is um, somewhat slow intellectually and his sister who is bright as a tack but they were shunned by the villagers. The villagers were afraid. They thought these were spirits that were taking them. And as the palliative care team and came around, got to know them, raised money. They did not, this family did not have a place to stay, so they just were in the rain when it would rain. So again, they raised funds with local church and they built a hut and they would come and be with them. And you can see the villages all gathered around. The whole stigma for this family is removed by the personal care that's being given. This issue of using technology to extend person-centered care, which is what palliative care is about, it's not just in Africa, it's here too. So this is an old guy, he's almost 90, and he's caring for his wife of more than 65 years. Really tender, she's utterly disabled. And he rolls her gently and massages her joints and carefully feeds her bite after bite. But he is way out there, he's hard to get to. And there are lots and lots of people who are dealing with really hard things in a remote environment, not just here in Pennsylvania. This is true in Tennessee. This is true all over the place. And we have a limited number of palliative care team members, nurses, doctors. How do we reach all these people? Well, we can use technology. If we can have a device there in the home and have it set up so once he meets the nurse or the doctor, the first visit, Future visits, sometimes we can just click in and see each other. And it turns out if he can look at my face and I'm looking at him, it feels like we're connected. That feels patients and families like that. So using technology to push this out, super important with the person at the center. This is the last family I'll talk of. And this was an old guy way out in one of the villages. We came to see him and as we went out there, his wife came in from under the tree out in front and sat down with him. And as we were talking to them in Swahili, I don't speak Swahili, it was translated. And it turns out they were in their 80s. And when this came up, our Tanzanian friend said, what? And stepped out of the hut and said, come in here, you guys, you should see this. And took their pictures. People living into their 80s, this never happens that people live together like this. This woman was quite proud as we were taking pictures. She sat right up and looked at us. So person-centered care, using technology to get to them, to touch more people, super important. That's where we are now. Dr. Ask is gonna be talking a bit about what is the future? What will be?
Mm. There we go. Dr. Nesbitt spoke about using technology to reach out to people and extend expertise that we may have in this country to people that don't have it. So we're going to look at some ideas here for the last few moments regarding technology and reaching people that normally can't be reached. <clears throat> and there's a lot of technology out there already that can do this sort of thing. So for example, uh, 200 feet from me is an AED that we could do resuscitation with, which is really a remarkable thing. But there's technology currently from um, 3D printing uh, uh, prosthetics to uh, vitamin pills to uh, other types of technology that lets us apply modern approaches to the developing world. And I've got something here that shows you how we can extend expertise. I was born with three heart defects. Uh, two were operated on when I was 11 days old. That was the first of many heart surgeries for 34-year-old Whitney Hatchett. But none was quite like last year's. It was either to use the robot and have three small scars on my back, or if it was done by conventionally, I would have a scar all the way around. What we wanted to do is provide her with an operation that uh, posed the least impact to her physically. Dr. David Yu is Whitney's surgeon and used this robot called Da Vinci to perform her procedure. It allows us to do the kind of intricate uh, maneuvers within her chest that would otherwise require a large incision. When he's not in surgery, you might find Hugh honing his skills on the Da Vinci at the Engineering Research Center for Computer Integrated Surgical Systems here at Johns Hopkins University. Support from the National Science Foundation has kept the center on the cutting edge, developing surgical robotic technology. We're trying to couple the capabilities of machines with the judgment of humans to help do a job better. We have the opportunity to work at the cutting edge of technology in direct partnership with physicians who have real problems. So surgeons like you come here to take the robots out for a test spin. He's using the Da Vinci on the heart of a dead pig to try out its new measuring tool. It's very impressive, it's very impressive. The video overlay is very uh, helpful where we can actually see what we're measuring right at the time of the operation is very important and, it, and it's, it's something that, that we're looking forward to, to trying. It's really amazing one, because one, I can't one. feel the difference between the different forces. Surgeon Jim Handa tests out this steady hand robot, crucial for delicate eye surgery. The robot can smoothen out the movement and make um, someone who's not able to do it, do it quite easily. Taylor says as the technology developed here improves, so will patient care. We can transcend human limits. We can enable a clinician to do things that cannot be done. And that has made all the difference for Whitney Hatchett. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. So that was an example of extending medical care far afield, or the potential to do that. That includes both visualization and haptic feedback, this sort of tactile feedback. So designers approach things in unique ways, so it's not really the scientific method. It starts with developing an empathy for the patient in this case, and then coming up with uh, identifying patterns, trying to really understand the point of view of the patient, and then going through a, an idea generation stage where you come up with a lot of ideas, and you often think of this as the creative part of the innovation and, uh, and uh, design. Then we try things out, we experiment, see what works and what doesn't work. We make things physical and actually try to, try to execute our ideas. So it's sort of this uh, feedback loop that we deal with in, in the world of design. And what's interesting, if you think broadly, and we're going to look at some futuristic ideas here, um, physicians aren't perfect. They make mistakes. And there's a, a, a small band between this ideal notion of perfection and what a doctor can do. And technology can come alongside a doctor to improve that ability. So as doctors and, and medical staff understand the nature of the illness, the, uh, even the cultural context of pain and suffering, they get better and better at what they do. And technology, of course, has increased rapidly over the years. So it really comes alongside the doctor and other medical staff in a very helpful way and empowers people that might not otherwise be able to execute, uh, we'll say, modern medicine. Now here, if you think about how to handle this problem that we're looking at here, improving resources, uh, or improving access in resource poor areas, you can think of three ideas. And again, this is an idea of visualizing what a problem looks like and trying to break it down. So you can, uh, you can have more doctors, you can uh, drop them out of parachutes along with hospitals and medical staff. 
you can have more technology assistance of the existing infrastructure, or you can have autonomous technology, as uh, Dr. Nesbitt had referred to that as well, sort of the ability for people to take care of themselves in a way. So if you look at this graph, um, and I have to give credit to Dr. Ball, because as we sat around the dining room table discussing these things, you know, I said there's a case for autonomous technology. He pointed out properly that a Mars station would be a good one for that. So if you have a handful of Mar people on Mars, you can't send a whole medical staff. So there's an area where you need some kind of technology to completely supplant what the medical infrastructure here does. In Boston, you only go a few feet before you run into a doctor, so you don't have as much of the problem there. And in the developing world, of course, you fall somewhere in between. And so what I'm proposing here is a, a, an idea that isn't perfect. In other words, you can't replace the human, which is really the thesis of this whole discussion that we're having, but, but we can do things to make things better. So uh, I'd like to look at the notion of artificial intelligence and, and introduce what it is. So artificial intelligence is a computer system, we'll say, that simulates human thinking, cognition, and sensory inputs. It's a very powerful thing, but it's not new. And I've got a real interesting slide for you right here, which some of you might find interesting, but it's sort of the, uh, a, a good way to look right into what artificial intelligence is. And uh, over 25 years ago, I got involved with this discipline. I got forced into it because I was hired by Ingersoll Rand to replace a fellow that was retiring. And it's sort of the worst fear that people have, some big giant mass of experience is gonna walk out of the door. What do you do? So I was sent off to learn software and replace him with a machine, with a computer. And of course it doesn't work out quite that way, but I did write some expert systems and uh, it was very interesting. And this would have been uh, like in the early 90s. So this whole notion of artificial intelligence is quite old. And if you look at this command line here, this, here you're looking into the, into the heart and maybe the soul of artificial intelligence in a way that's understandable. It's got these if-then commands, and that's how you live your life. If it's cold, then wear a coat, right? That's how you do things. Um, you don't take an umbrella with you if it's raining. You first ask a bunch of questions. You say, is it raining hard? Do I have to walk in the rain? What kind of clothes am I wearing? Is the wind blowing? You have all these inputs that go into this decision-making process that help you make a decision about something as simple as an umbrella, which you think is a trivial decision. So how do you replace a physician with something like this? Well, you have another flavor in this too, that CF equals 90. That's a confidence factor. And it's saying, this is how confident I am in this guess, in this judgment. You know, is it cold outside? Yes, the 90% confidence factor, because it's not real cold, but it's kind of cold. So that's where that comes into play. And of note, though, if you look at this kind of simple code, uh, it doesn't handle a certain thing. It doesn't handle human creativity in asking what if. Uh, it, it doesn't handle what humans can do in a beautiful set way and say, uh, here's a problem that no one's identified. How do you resolve that one? You know, looking out beyond the, the sort of the linear progression of, of computer programming. So what I'm going to talk about here is uh, a couple of ideas, uh, what I call a small black box and a big black box. And the small black box is basically a decision-making machine that can do diagnosis in this case. And the large black box is something else. It's much more futuristically oriented, but I think you'll, you'll find it interesting. And in the small black box, this is sort of what I discussed before about an umbrella. You take a bunch of the rules of thumb or heuristics and you jam them into a computer and then you couple that with with the patient uh, symptoms, signs and symptoms, and you combine, you drive them through a rule-based system, and you come up with a diagnosis. So you can use this in certain really specific areas. You can say, for these following conditions, this is what you should do about it. And you can take this, make it very portable, and, and send it uh, far afield. But what's interesting is sort of the new generation of the artificial intelligence in the form of deep learning, neural networks, uh, all these other buzzwords that go about, but these have a really distinctive ability to learn. Humans can learn, and we don't just learn by learning rules, we learn by making mistakes. You don't learn to ride a bicycle by somebody telling you a bunch of rules. You learn a few rules, you get on the bike, you feel the instability, and you correct for it, and there's a visceral learning that goes on. So there was an interesting article uh, uh, in Nature that just came out recently. It's based on work from 2014 on, and what these types of programs are, different than the code I showed you before with the if-then statements, if it's cold, take a coat, 
These things are learning from data. I can throw a bunch of data at this computer system, and it will, uh, it will detect the patterns. So uh, it's been used in the financial market for a long time. So the question is, can it, how well can it extend into medicine? Uh, how far can these deep learning machines go into medicine beyond the heuristics that we're kind of familiar with? So in the first part of this study, they looked at uh, a group of, well, they were researchers, but they were working with dermatologists to uh, diagnose melanoma, which is very dangerous. And uh, typically, the melanoma diagnosis is driven by a mnemonic A, B, C, D, where they look at the, uh, you know, the asymmetry, the borders, the color, and the diameter of the lesion. So what research did is they went, they went and they took 14,000 images that were previously diagnosed by dermatologists, and they fed them into this AI system. And uh, I can go into more detail with that later if there's interest afterwards. But uh, and they were trying to discern between uh, benign lesions, cancerous lesions, and just non-cancerous growths. And this system was good 72% of the time, which was actually better than a very small contingent of dermatologists they compared it with. But if we look at this, now this is a bit, uh, hopefully not too tiresome for the eyes at this, at this hour, but this was based on 2,000 biopsy-proven uh, specimens. So these are gold standards. These are images for which there was, there was uh, data verifying their condition, whether they were cancerous or non-cancerous or, or just growths. And these were fed into the neural network to compare against a larger group of uh, almost 25 uh, dermatologists, and in other words, they took the 2,000 images and they were in different categories. I have a couple, I have, I have carcinoma and melanoma up here. And this shows how the, derma, how the uh, neural network worked, or how well it did anyway. And if you look at this, if I can get this to work here. Now, I, I should mention, th these are visual samples of skin lesions. So this isn't as complicated as pain and palliative care. But if you look at melanoma, for example, we're looking at false positives and false negatives. So we're really worried about false negatives. And some of you may be kind of interested in the detail here. But these red dots represent individual dermatologists. So there were, there were 22 dermatologists, board-certified dermatologists. And this is how they assessed these 130 images that had melanoma. And the green arrow right there is, is the average value for these dermatologists. And the blue is what the neural network did. So the neural network did better than almost all the dermatologists in terms of diagnosing this. Uh, so it was really powerful data. And again, this just came out and it shows you really the potential of what these learning machines can do for us. Okay, so here is the big black box, and this is a comprehensive system of evaluating, of evaluating a lot of data. And what's most unique here is you're trying to get historical data for the patient. Now, this is futuristic. You can't get this right now. So, so let's extend out into the future and say, well, what if there was this big machine that could capture all this data and develop a, a treatment plan for a patient that was really effective, and it could do it autonomously. So here you have you know, sensors collecting data, there's a baseline of the patient, a collection of historical data, these heuristics, these rules of thumbs, uh, symptoms, signs and symptoms from the patient, and then an ethnographic context upon which this can act. So if you're looking at um, this big black box, what would it look like? I have no idea. It might be like an astronaut suit. You might walk around like Darth Vader for an hour as this thing captures data from you. It might be a gelatinous bath you sit into, and it captures everything from foot, uh, foot to, to finger, including maybe a brain scan in between. So it can take on a lot of different forms. But the notion of this is that you take this, the, the whole ability, not only of the medical infrastructure worldwide, which can be fed into a computer, but you also learn about the individual patient, and you see this progression in time. So you know, for example, uh, looking from, going from acute to chronic pain can be difficult to discern, and things like this can help with this. Now, you see ethno ethnography is tied into there, and uh, Dr. Ball talked about uh, medical nemesis, which has a good chapter in there about the context for pain, the cultural context for pain, and what it means to be uh, disfigured, to be weak, uh, to be aided in some fashion. There's a context that is quite different in other countries than what we might encounter here. So if we look at 
Let's see, there we go. Uh, ethnography, and ethnography is a study of people. So we're all ethnographers. When you go to the mall, you look at people and you make these deductions about what they're like based on various things. So what that ethnography tries to do is parse this data. It tries to let the data drive decisions, but this data isn't the hard science that you would see in the medical field. It's a, a different arena. It's what do people, what are people really believing in in terms of their, their, their life? What is their... What are their faith traditions? What are their social norms? What culture are they coming from? When they say yes, do they mean no? Uh, um, and this is not as obvious as you might think. So for example, if you asked me what my favorite food was, okay, if somebody from the audience asked that, I'd say broccoli because I'm such a health nut. But if you looked at what I spent money on, if you looked in my garbage can, if you followed me around all day, you'd find that's not the case. Uh, it might be chocolate or something like that. So what I say there is different than what I uh, might actually do, and there's this kind of social acquiescence bias that we look at. And so when we look at a problem, like here we're looking at pain and palliative care, we bring into it a whole set of our own values. So this is by way of demonstration, and some of you, when you look at this FedEx sign, which it was, this was actually parked in my driveway. I took the photograph, so there's no copyright issues here at all. But as you look at this, uh, some of you see an arrow in there, and some of you don't. And in a few minutes, those of you that don't see an arrow will see an arrow in this, in this lettering for the rest of your days. I will have rung the bell, and you can't unring the bell. So here is the arrow. It's there, cleverly disguised. And now it's gone, but you see it. And you can't unsee it. So ethnography tries really hard to unsee our own cultural norms. It tries to extract that from the equation. So there are problems, though, with this notion of the big black box, this big scary box that you put on and it gathers all sorts of data. One of them is, is it programming prejudice into the system. So if your ethnographic data says um, this population uh, t uh, communally cares for its elderly, and not, there's not a familial connection, that's not always the case. People are different. So for some reason, maybe an elderly person is ostracized, and that model doesn't work. So it's an interesting question as to whether this sort of automation of a lot of this programs in things like prejudice. Obviously, if you're, another issue is privacy, and that's been discussed in another uh, colloquium uh, about a year or so ago, I believe. And you have all this data out there about you as a person, and, and obviously there's challenges with that. And then you have um, the, the human nature element of it. Uh, if you're proud of your profession, and someone has a temerity to say you're being replaced by a machine, that's going to affect your sense of dignity, your sense of identity, and may, maybe even your pride. So where this is really ending is this notion of this big black box Computer technology at its richest and finest, using all sorts of powerful uh, machinations and, and approaches that is fed into, not, a, not to the patient, but into a, a loving caregiver. Someone who has insights into the patient. And what we're arguing here, the three of us, is that it's really the loving caregiver that is a most effective tool in dispensing palliative care. So in palliative care, it's, it's, as Dr. Ball had mentioned, it's an integrative approach where you're looking at the physical and the spiritual and the, and the social elements of caring for someone. It's not just giving someone a pill. So this kind of generic model is suggesting that the, the data from technology goes to someone that loves a patient. And love is a funny thing to talk about when you're looking at technology because you think, what is that? But people recognize humans in a distinctive way. We recognize that they have sacrificial attributes. A machine can't sacrifice. A, a human can. They sacrifice time and expertise, and we, we respond to that. Humans uh, have empathy, and machines don't. And a human has this contact, and that can never be replaced. So it's, um, this is kind of the model we, we had proposed for how to handle palliative care treatment plans in resource-poor areas. So, Really, this is, these are our conclusions, sort of the repeat of what I presented. Namely, technology should go, for palliative care, should go through a caregiver who has a relationship with the patient, has some kind of connection with the patient that a machine would never have, or even a physician. And we should recognize the very beautiful nature of humanity in the sense that we can come up with creative notions <clears throat> that machines with their virtual eyes 
machines with their virtual ears, machines with their virtual sense of touch can only look at in virtual wonder as people do these, these beautiful things. So there's a place for people among the machine technology and the, as Dr. Ball mentioned, the patient is always at the center of this sort of uh, approach to uh, migrating technology into medicine. Thank you. That was a lot of excellent information. We do have a little bit of time. We can take a question or two now. So Wendy and Chris have some microphones. Um, if you do have a question, please approach either one and, and we have time for a question or two. Does anyone have a question? Come on students, don't be shy. Raise your hands. Um. This refers to the uh, last piece. How far in the future are you predicting we could have this large black box? That's a good question. When you deal with futurism, it's a very safe topic because nobody can hold you accountable. So it's a very safe place to rest. <laughs> so it will be 10 years after I retire. How's that? Uh, these deep neural networks are happening right now. Whenever you use Google Photos and all these sort of applications, we're doing it right now. So. Um, the big problem is getting data, non-invasive data from patients. You know, actually, the spacesuit thing. How do you get data from patients in a non-invasive way in Tanzania? And that is 30 years away. <laughs> to throw a number good at you. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Do we have any other questions? Thank you. A wonderful uh, presentation, by the way. Doctors, any one of you, um, how do you feel uh, uh, about the um, regulatory environment um, keeping up with technology, whether it's telemedicine or any other type of uh, technology, medical care, uh, uh, thing like that? So, uh, um, I think regulations and uh, government oversight is always behind what is actually available and, um, and helps. So for example, in the world of telemedicine, for us to be able to do virtual visits, um, it's right now in most places you can't bill for that. Medicare has restrictions on that. You can only do that in certain areas. Um, so that's a problem in the world of increasing the amount of visits that way that have been shown to be very satisfactory for patients and families and can reach more people. That is restricted by regulations at this time. So I, I just think there's kind of a bit of a delay that way. The other issue is that often regulations seem to be reactionary to a specific issue. And so as an example, um, you know, a lot of the privacy laws were designed such that they were reacting to a specific problem that was identified. And one of the problems that we run into now is that, um, you know, we have multiple electronic health records across the country that do not speak to one another because they're trying to maintain privacy, which means that a lot of the benefits of technology from electronic health records are not gained. And so, um, you know, it would be great to break down some of those barriers to a certain extent, as long as it doesn't actually harm, you know, patients individually with their privacy. Yeah. Excellent. We have time for one more question, and then we can also continue our discussions downstairs at the reception. Could you comment on what happens to the care provider as he or she gives himself, gives herself to the great needs uh, that you've described here of uh, people with terminal illness or age or what happens to you as you give care? How do you have to care for yourself so that you can care for others? Uh, um, I'll just speak from my perspective. It's a really important issue because a part of uh, compassion means entering into the suffering of the person that you're with. It's not sympathy where I feel sorry for you, poor person over there. 
It means I'm entering into your suffering and being close enough that it takes a piece of me. And so um, it's really important as we do this that we do it as team. So in the world of hospice and palliative care, we work as a part of a team. And we do that for the benefit of the patient and family that we're caring for. So the nurse and the chaplain and the social worker and the volunteer, we're all bringing our role together. But we also do it for ourselves because as we're doing this as a team, we can support each other. And if one of us is getting really hurt, you know, I've had it where I've been involved in a case that was making me so sad, I was just feeling overwhelmed. And if my teammates are able to say, boy, this one's really getting you, let me step in for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, it helps us sustain and find our way through it. Um, and then just personal resources. I, I think that for any of us as we're dealing with really hard situations, dealing with suffering, um, we can learn a lot deep inside of ourselves. So it kind of can develop um, interior resources as well. Excellent, thank you. Dr. Bold, Dr. Nesbitt, Dr. Ask, I'd like to thank you so much for your presentation and for taking the time out of your schedules to be here with us this evening. We're very appreciative, so thank you. Thank you. And before we move to the reception, I'd just like to quickly mention the next presentation in this colloquia series, which will be on Tuesday, April 10th, 2018. Rebecca Strelick will join us to speak about creative problem solving through art and engineering. So please mark your calendars for April 10th and plan to join us once again. At this time, everyone's invited downstairs to Rapture for the reception. Thank you.